So, Father, thank you for gathering us together. Thank you for a place that reflects the love and, and uh, concern and uh, uh, efforts of uh, many people. Uh, Lord, we now ask that in this time, our hearts can be open to your voice. Would you minister to us in the different ways this morning, whether that finds a, a place in the songs where the words just connect to our hearts, or in our time of, of giving, that just that expression of thanks to you and time around your word, Father, that in e these ways this morning, our hearts can enter in to praise for you. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this time. And we ask your blessing on it in your name. Amen. That's amazing. We had, uh, we know where everybody sits. And uh, so when we found gum on the bottom of the pews, we know now exactly who put the gum there. So you might just want to make note if you want to change seats next week, you might want to do that. So we got Joe's drums out of Hawk. I, I pawned them off for a hundred bucks and uh, I guess that wasn't going to work. So we got them back and now look, at I'm glad to have Joe back up here again. So we'll see what we can do here. Let's all stand. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. I will call upon the Lord. The Lord liveth and blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth and blessed be the rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved by my enemies. I will call upon the Lord. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all pains. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. His love endures forever For the life that's been reborn His love endures forever Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Forever God is faithful forever God is strong forever God is with us forever forever from the rising to the setting sun his love endures forever and by the grace of God we will carry on his love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us forever, forever. Woo, gooseys. 
<laughs> Let's take time to greet one another. Oh, the wonderful cross 
draw near and bless your name. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too I think you're all aware that uh, sometimes the things that uh, the Lord is doing and the times that he has to work in our lives come with a, a waiting period. And it comes to be a time where you're aware that the Lord has something in mind and yet there's a period of time, a, a wait, that takes, needs to take place before those final things are, are experienced. Well, the waiting is almost over for one of the things that the Lord is doing within our midst, and that is that Katrina, Katrina's having her baby tomorrow. It's, uh, it's on the books, it's ready to go, and uh, tomorrow morning, Lord willing, and uh, certainly God has been with it, and it seems like it should happen without any complications, right? We're going to take a moment, we're going to pray for Katrina, right? And uh, so, let's see, let's have everybody stand. And for those of you that are close enough or that can move across the aisle, why don't you just go and stand next to Katrina, put your hand on her shoulder, just again, um, have that sense of love for her, just that commitment to pray for her on the part of us as a family. Yeah. Katrina, we just love you, and we love the way the Lord has been at work and his provision for you. So we're going to pray. So, Heavenly Father, we lift up Katrina to you. We thank you for this young life that you have granted to them. And Father, we would ask again for your enabling for this delivery. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this baby to term. Thank you for the doctors who have come alongside and offered their care in this period of time. And Lord, I know that this is a a uh, challenging wait, even in this last day. So, Father, we commit even these last few hours of the wait to you. And, Lord, we pray that, that you would grant your rest in this night for her, that she would be able to sleep well, to find the, the rest that she needs for the work of the day tomorrow and these coming days. Father, thank you for the privilege of sharing in your work, in Katrina's life, in the life of the Hintz family. We'd ask your blessing on each one of them in these coming days. In your name, amen. Hmm. So I think all of us recognize that within the gospel story, that there are periods of time in which Jesus' popularity just begins to go through the roof. We saw a little bit of that last week as we looked at the story of the feeding of the 5,000, right? Free dinner for 5,000 is always a hit, and uh, that, that's not really meant to be an uh, introduction to lunch today, but there is, there is lunch today, and I hope that you'll stay to enjoy it with us. Jesus' popularity and John chapter 6 is going through the roof. I mean, there's just this period of time in which the news about what he's done and the way he approaches life is uh, just drawing an audience from, well, regions beyond even uh, Jerusalem and Judea and Galilee into the entire country. The message has, has uh, begun to percolate and, and resound. 
But for the disciples that follow Jesus, this is one of those times in which the waves of popularity move them into all sorts of different places and different ways, and it becomes a challenge for them. They, they think that life is going one way, and all of a sudden Jesus moves it into another way. It becomes uh, times when they're almost disoriented by the different experiences that Jesus brings them through. Let, let's, let's just take a moment. And read kind of those verses together. It's found in Mark chapter 6, verses 45, and we'll stop at verse 52. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat after the feeding of the 5,000 and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountain to pray. And later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. And he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. And shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost, and they cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down, they were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves, and their hearts were hardened. So you come to the end of this experience with them there on the lake, all the wind and stormy water of that uh, experience, and it harkens right back to that, that moment in which Jesus had fed the 5,000. Certainly, they're a little confused about what's going on, right? We're a little confused about what's going on, almost reading it back and being perhaps familiar to many of us. The feeding of the 5,000 was this amazing experience only to be sent away and find themselves in the middle of a storm. So a couple of things about the reality of life, about navigating through those times in which your sights were on one particular direction and your experience finds that you can't go that way. It looks different than you thought. It's confusing. In this account, there's at least three things, I think, that'll help us in those periods of time. The first one is this, that Christ's timing is different than ours. Christ's timing is different than ours. You see that in kind of these rapid-fire events that all seem to take place on one action-packed day here in Mark chapter 6. And we know the Gospels pitch the events, and sometimes these events occur in different orders and other things. So it's really not so much about that it's on one day. It's about the, these experiences that come from different directions. We think that things ought to happen when we expect them to happen or when we want them to happen, or we think now, now is the time for this, and other events we think, oh, not now, right? We don't want this to happen now. I'm not ready for this now. And yet, somehow God seems to be weaving us through the experiences, the, the circumstances of our lives in ways that we don't. The reality is that God knows better. Christ knows better how to put together the experiences in our life and how to take those things from our past that were, well, painful, maybe wrong, even misguided or bullheaded. <laughs> Not that any of the rest of you would be like that, but those kind of experiences, God knows how to use them. And our confusion about those experiences doesn't cancel that fact. Doesn't cancel the fact that God still is in control. There is a, a book I often recommend. It's written by um, the president the man who's now the president of our denomination called An Honest Look at a Mysterious Journey. And in it, he uh, tells the story of his uh, year and a half of suffering through a disease that took all of the muscles in his body and reduced them to like nothing until there wasn't hardly a single muscle within his body that wasn't affected. And he was left finally after a period of slow, slow recovery, he was left without the ability to swallow. And so for almost a year and a half, nothing would go down his throat. And he talked about how difficult that was, how isolating and painful and discouraging it was, right? Just think of how many parts of life center around food at almost every celebration, every holiday, every social interaction, all of those things all involve food, 
right? You meet with someone and you share a cup of coffee. No, no coffee for nothing was going down his throat. And it was even a little bit worse than that in that he couldn't even swallow his own saliva for those months. In this book, he reflects on that experience, right? He tries to describe what it was really like, honestly, how discouraging and painful and um, what he thought was going on in those days and when he didn't. And during that period of time, he, 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 he tried to acknowledge God's goodness in the midst of him, right? And let me just read kind of one of his reflections on it. He said, I was called to deeper faith in the midst of uncertainty. I was challenged to trust him when I could neither see him nor much evidence of him. I was being reduced to the most foundational place of trust. Would I believe he is good whether or not I circumstantially experiencing anything that felt good? Over and over I declared it during these months. God is in this and he is good. Over and over I would be challenged to keep believing my own profession. His goodness wasn't something I could always see or feel. Some people disputed my God is in this statement. They concluded that I was attributing my illness to God. They believed that he would not do such a thing. I wasn't blaming God or attributing my illness to God. I, I didn't pretend to know what had hit me. Satanic attack, some bug from Brazil. Had I worn myself down with my high energy level? I didn't know and still don't know. But what I do know is that I can't leave God out of the scenario. My life was in him, and his life is in me, mine. In him we live and move and have our being, Paul taught in Acts 17. He reinforced his teaching in other passages. I am in Christ, and Christ in me, he would write. How could I believe these things to be true and then say that he had nothing to do with this illness? At a minimum, he, he allowed it. I was beginning to suspect that he even desired it. God is not the source of evil, but no e evil is outside of his jurisdiction. I don't know exactly what I should think and believe about God's involvement in my situation, but I knew that I couldn't believe that my illness was beyond him. No, he was in this somewhere, somehow, and he can only be good. To believe anything else would have been to fall into ultimate despair. <sighs> Circumstances, right? Out of our control are, are not beyond his. Circumstances beyond our understanding are not beyond what he has to do. Think about what goes on in the story, right? Jesus sends his disciples away. Right? Remember what it says? Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into a boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida. So they gather up the leftovers, right, from the uh, feeding of the 5,000, all those baskets of leftovers. They load them in the boat with them. I'm, I'm assuming they took the leftovers along with them. And they get into the boat. And Jesus it stays behind and disciples leave. He makes them sail off. He says, okay, you guys, go. Time for you to go. Go now. Ah. So do you think the disciples wanted to go? Do you think they wanted to go? I, I don't think so. I, I don't think the disciples wanted to go. I think they wanted to stay behind and bask in Jesus' success. Right? Who wouldn't? Right? Jesus had just fed 5,000 men plus the women and children. He fed all these people and the disciples were right there. They had the they had the inside story about what Jesus had done. Just think how much fun it would have been for them to wander around and tell this group of people, hey, there were only, there were only five loaves and two fish. That's all there were. And Jesus took them and he blessed them and he broke them. And, hey, I watched it. I was there. I bet I was, I, I don't think they wanted to go. I think they wanted to stay and tell the story. They had been involved. They were popular people, right? They held the baskets. They passed them out to the people, and Jesus sends them away. They, don't, they aren't given time to enjoy the moment. All right, so clearly this was not the time for the disciples to tell the whole story. This is not the time for them to go on and on and on about two loaves, or five loaves, two fish, and uh, 5,000 people. This wasn't the time. 
But guess what? Now's the time. Now's the time for you and I to know what Jesus did, how he did it, and, and to see the, the experience that the disciples had to have. The, Jesus sends his disciples away. His timing is different than theirs. Get it? That's the point. There is a time for the story to be told. That's why we have it written down here. The disciples told it. They shared it with us. We, we get to see behind the scenes of the crowd Jesus sends his disciples away. Not only that, he sends the crowd away. Same, same kind of thing, right? It, immediately after the disciples get into the boat, he sends the crowd. He dismisses the crowd. So same question. Do you think the crowd wanted to go? No, I don't think so. Right? They had just found someone willing to feed them for free. Right? The crowd has this insatiable appetite for more, more, more food, more teaching, more, more of Jesus. Just give us, give us more, give us more. They're like the, the little uh, baby uh, birds in the nest. Every time the mom comes by, what do they do? They open their mouth wide. Right? More, more, more. Feed me more. Feed me more. The needs of the crowd never stop. More crowds. More demands, even, even at the end of the story, right? If you'd go on reading, it didn't stop at verse 52, verse 53, more crowds. <laughs> They're there always. It's interesting that early in the feeding of the 5,000, the disciples come to Jesus and they say, hey, send the crowds away so they can go take care of themselves. But Jesus doesn't send them away then. Now he sends them away. Different timing, right? Now the crowds don't want to go, but Jesus makes them go. John chapter 6, it talks about how the crowds wanted to make Jesus king by force because of what he's doing at this time. But Jesus doesn't want to be king in this moment. He is the king, but he's not going to take his throne the way the crowds want him to. One day, still in the future, Jesus is going to be crowned king. His authority acknowledged by everyone whose every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord of heaven and earth. But in this moment, in the midst of the confusion, Jesus sends the crowd away. But our confusion, the confusion of the disciples, the confusion of the crowd, doesn't cancel Christ's control. It doesn't change his ability to take those moments and shape, to shape them. Hmm. Secondly, our ideas don't, don't change his agenda. His timing is better than ours. It's shaped by a source that you and I often fail to tap into, right? It tells us that afterwards, after leaving them, Jesus goes up on the mountain to pray. We see that pattern clearly in Jesus' ministry from the very beginning, right before he goes to call his disciples, he goes up and spends time in prayer. Other times, right, clear to the very end of his earthly ministry, where does he spend his last night before going to the cross? He spends it in prayer. Jesus tapped into God's agenda for him, not his disciples' agenda, right? His disciples would have had him like take those 5,000 people and create a great movement and maybe begin to march on Jerusalem, storm the gates, fill the town, take over. But the disciples' ideas, the crowd's ideas, don't shape Jesus' agenda. Jesus' agenda is shaped by his heavenly Father. He's listening to God's voice, not the clamor of the crowd, not the excitement of the disciples. Hmm. Who sets your agenda? Who determines what's the most important thing for you to do? To, how, who focuses the attention of your heart? There, there is something for you to do. There's a direction. There is timing. There is a way to go forward. There is an agenda for your life, but you m more are called to receive it than to set it for yourself. Because 
you and I don't have all the pieces to the story. Uh, navigating through conf confusing circumstances is a part of, of life. And part of the things that are confusing is that we only have our, our present, our past, our own resources in hand. And we don't see. We don't see what God has intended or what he can do if we will offer it up to him. A, a pastor friend of mine tells a story of uh, a practice in their home. He has, he's married and they have adopted a large group of children. I don't know what there is, eight in their family now or something like that. And, and uh, his wife is, you know, very capable and takes care of almost all the things within their home during the course of the week. But one, one meal a week is kind of his. On Saturday morning, he makes waffles. He makes waffles for his family, and, uh, and it's just uh, the way, the pattern of their family, the practice in their family, and uh, he, he has uh, then on, on Friday night come to his kids, and he says, who wants, to, who wants to help? Who wants to help make waffles? Now, the, the kids and his family aren't really a lot of help. Okay, and in fact, a lot of what they do, it makes actually the process of waffles a little more complicated, right? And sometimes the, the kids will get overexcited about what's happening, won't be paying attention to the recipe very well, and they'll mess it up. And in fact, you have to dump out the batter, and you have to start all over, and all of those things. But he invites them to come and to help make waffles. And what does he do? There at the breakfast table when all the waffles are finally made because there is going to be waffles, right? Waffles are going to show up on the table there as everybody's gathered around about to have breakfast just as now. Everyone thank whoever helped for making waffles. That's just a little picture of what God invites us into. He invites us into his plan, his story. Not, not because we are so great and we have so much to offer, but because in some amazing way he designed each man, each woman, each boy, each girl to play a part, to have a part, to enter in, to, to be participants in his plans. It can be confusing at times. Because his timing is different from ours. But you can find encouragement in the fact that his resources go beyond ours. Right? He's the one that gathers together the ingredients. He's the one that has the recipe to create a future. To, to bring about his plan to develop those things. That's pretty clear, isn't it, in the story of Jesus and his disciples on the lake. Tells us that that night the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on the land. And he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. All right, again, we come to this moment where the disciples realize that they don't have enough resources on their own. They are exhausted by the challenges of their situation. We don't know exactly where the feeding of the 5,000 take place, but it's often think, you know, one of the east, eastern or western shores of the lake. And to head to Bethsaida is to go north, right? So it's just to come from one of the sides up to the point and find their destination, but that's not where we find them. After they had been sent out in their boat and struggling, straining, until this very time, they're now not at the northern end. They're in the middle uh, of the lake. Remember, Jesus sent them out sometime after supper, and now it is shortly before dawn. I don't know what time that would be, something like 4 a.m. So they could have been trying to get this boat to shore, trying to make it to Bethsaida for a long time. Six, eight hours of struggling on the water. They're in serious danger by now. 
We see that often, that when the disciples don't see Jesus, aren't aware of what, uh, where he is or what's going on, that they find themselves in serious trouble. Uh, in confusing circumstances, they have used up all of their energy, and there must be out there in the middle of the lake going, why is this so hard? Jesus told us to go. We're going, right? Why, why does it have to be so hard? And they've gone from this exhilarating experience of being part of Jesus, supplying this amazing need for 5,000 people, seeing him multiply the resources in that moment to almost this whiplash experience of exhaustion from euphoria to terror. Hmm. Then Jesus intervenes. Hmm. So he saw the disciples, right, straining at the oars because the wind was against them. And shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. And he was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. Just, just think a couple of minutes about the steps involved in here, right, for a moment. Jesus, Jesus sees. He sees, right, his eye, right? What's the, what's the old hymn go? His eye is on the sparrow. I know he watches over me. That sense of Jesus' attention, his awareness, his, his ability to perceive where his disciples are is, well, it's different in the midst of the circumstances than the disciples thought. Right? They, they were focused on the storm. They're focused on this exhaustion and their little ship and the challenge that it's in the middle of, and they didn't realize that Jesus was aware of them seems to be that they felt all alone. They must have thought they were abandoned, but they weren't. Jesus saw them. In confusing circumstances, right? When you realize you don't have enough resources on your own to handle them, to know the decision to make, the way to go, what to do in the midst of them. Remember that it's not about what you have. It's about what Christ wants to bring to bear in the midst of your confusing circumstances. He would later give his disciples this daunting task. He would tell them to go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptize, teaching and baptizing, doing all those things, right? But he gives them this amazing promise to go along with it. He says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. Jesus sees and Jesus comes near. He comes down to them walking on the lake. It's interesting that this is where um, the story would be where Peter would get out of the boat. You know, Lord, if it's you, let me come to you. And Peter would walk on the water and all those things. It doesn't show up in Mark's gospel. It's one of those places where we look at Mark and we realize that maybe that's what has kind of traditionally been thought, that Mark writes stories from Peter. And so he refrains sometimes from telling the stories about Peter. Because Peter isn't trying to limelight. Perhaps that's what's going on here. But it tells us this phrase, right, that Jesus was about to pass by. Almost as if Jesus really wasn't going to stop and deal with his disciples. He was just going to kind of walk by and, uh, you know, say, Hey, you guys, how you doing, buddy? You know, I wasn't... That, so that phrase, about to pass by. When you come to phrases like that and things that stick out, that just seem either out of place or strange, then often they're there for a, for a, a reason, Often they show up there to draw a little bit of interest and a little bit of backstory into that moment. That, that phrase, about to pass by, is one that comes loaded with information and history from the Old Testament. You might remember the story of Moses. And as Moses goes up on the mountain to meet with God, and, and God wants to reveal to Moses who he is in, in a sense of his very physical presence passing by. And maybe you remember the story. It's where 
where God puts Moses into a cleft of the rock, and he shows Moses kind of his back. He gets a sense that he is there with him in the very physical presence. And it's that phrase that he comes to pass by. Picked up by the writer of the book of Job, right? And it talks about Jesus coming near on the water. That, that picture comes to us from Job where it says that God alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. So as Jesus comes by, he's, he's about to pass by, not so that the other people, not so that he doesn't come in contact with them, but so that he's revealing himself to them, God's glory right there in the person of Jesus, treading on the waves of the sea. He comes near. And he speaks to them, right? <laughs> so they all cry out, right? Because they're terrified. And he immediately he speaks to them and he says, take courage, it's I, don't be afraid. Those exhausted, frightened, confused, discouraged, right? Worn out disciples. Hear his voice talking to them, saying, look, you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. There's a lot of times in Mark's gospel where Jesus' presence brings a variety of responses, right? Even early in this chapter, in the first uh, three verses, there's two different responses. Right? When he comes and preaches in the synagogue, there people are amazed. And later in that same uh, section, they take offense at him. The crowds come to him longing to, to touch him and find free food. Here are the disciples. Find courage, encouragement from Jesus, from his presence right there. Finally, he calms the storm. Hmm. But there had been an earlier storm, right, in the Gospel of Mark. If this story sounds familiar, in Mark chapter 4, the disciples were with Jesus at another time crossing the same lake. And that time Jesus was in their boat. Remember, he's slept, sleeping on a cushion in the back. And the storms come and... The, Disciples finally wake him up and they're, terif they're terrified and say, Jesus, don't you care if we drowned? Right? Don't you care? Jesus, don't you care? It's like Jesus had clearly cared about them. But in that moment, in the confusing circumstances, they doubt his care. In, in this moment, and in that moment when Jesus is, calms the waves, they ask a question. They say, who is this? Even the wind and the waves Obey him. At this moment, he just simply says that he climbs into the boat with them and the wind died down. The point is Jesus. Jesus' intervention in the midst of the storm. It's all Jesus. He sees, he comes, he speaks, he calms. And navigating those confusing circumstances of your life, of your times, Remember that it's what Jesus does. It's how he takes your past failures, those sinful habits that you've found yourself again in the midst of, the, the discouraging times in which you refuse to look up and lift up your eyes, those moments in which you realize that you don't know enough to set your own direction for life, or facing a future that you wonder about, if you'll have the resources, what it will be like, if, if, if you'll be, well, cared for in different kinds of ways. Remember what the disciples needed to learn, what Jesus was trying to show them, and that is that he is enough. That Jesus helps them navigate their confusing circumstances, and he'll help us. His activity, what he has done and what he is doing, encourages ours. So Jesus climbs into the boat with them, and the wind dies down, and they were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves, and their hearts were hardened. We can ask ourselves that same thing. Do we understand about a Jesus 
who has done this? Do we understand who he is in the light of what is recorded for us about what he has done? Are you learning about what he has done the way the disciples should have been learning? Because their amazement in this moment is not a compliment to them. Right? Their amazement brings this criticism. They're, they're completely amazed for they hadn't understood something that they should have understood. The, the story is expanded in some of the other Gospels, right? In Matthew chapter 14, it talks about that moment where uh, Peter gets out of the boat, right? He walks on the water and uh, then he sees the wind and the waves and he begins to sink and, and uh, Jesus reaches down and he has this, has this kind of response to Peter. He says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And our tendency is to say, wait a minute. Look, look, Peter's there. He got out of the boat and everybody else is still in the boat. What about them? But Jesus is focused on Peter in that moment because Peter had taken those steps. He had begun. He had focused. He had things right. And he allowed those other things to distract him. He acted and then doubted. So Jesus in this story is encouraging their understanding to grow. In his activity, in his feeding the 5,000, he, he is demonstrating that he is enough, that he can provide, that he can think. But his lesson, the lesson for the disciples, isn't just about fish and bread. It's about who Jesus is. He is the one that can do this. He can provide. And he expected the disciples in the midst of the next circumstance they find to trust him too. The miracle, the miracle of the feeding should have been a lesson for the disciples in the storm. Their understanding of who Jesus was and is should have grown. Instead, they find themselves still doubting if Jesus is enough, if he can care for them, if he will undertake for them. That's what the call is for each one of us, to take what we know to be true, to take it and combine it into the circumstances of our lives, and to see a God who sent his son Jesus to the cross and to trust him to care for us and to see Jesus' provision for his followers in that day, to trust Jesus to provide for us also, for our understanding of him, of who he is, to grow. That's why we have the story for us. That's why it's there for us, the, the stories in the Gospels. That's why we see people trying to process their way through who Jesus was in the letters and in the story, the book of Acts. It's why those stories are preserved for us, to Encourage our understanding, for our minds to be able to come around who Jesus is in a way that grows and allows our commitment to him to deepen. In this moment, their hearts are described this way. It says that they didn't understand because their hearts were hardened. Hmm. Soft hearts, right? Soft hearts are those hearts that allow God's work and, and his identity and, and who he is to penetrate into ever deeper levels. But at this moment, it describes their hearts as hard. As the, the things that Jesus is trying to do, the demonstrations he's going to kind of make aren't, aren't allowed to, well, take root into deeper, deeper places. At best, we could say that they, they're overwhelmed. Right? They're overwhelmed by all those things. They just can't quite take it in. There's been so much. It's like trying to drink from a fire hose. They're blinded by their limitations. Or maybe, maybe they're calloused because they've experienced so much. Right? There's just been so many things happening to them. So familiar. Now they can't hardly take it in. Jesus just does all these things and they just are passive. At worst, they made a conscious choice to say, I know this is true. I believe Jesus did this. I'm just, I'm just going to go my way anyway. 
choosing to doubt, maybe because for them it was safer. Safer than letting go and saying, whatever he does, whatever he says, is right. Hmm. It brings us really to our place, to the challenge of understanding and commitment. To, to seeing Jesus in the light that he has clearly portrayed for us here in this story, throughout the stories of the Gospels, as a, a Jesus who has all authority and who invites us to submit to that authority in every area of our life. An, an understanding that goes deeper to where we're shaped by him. A maturing faith that seeps into every part of our lives, every relationship we have, every decision we make. We say to Jesus, look, I, I want you, who you are to penetrate into my heart in these areas. So Mark shows us kind of that process in the lives of the disciples. It wasn't always even. It wasn't always easy. It was never without a challenge. Those circumstances come and their commitments put to a test and they fail. And Jesus picks them back up. He takes them on to this next circumstance. And again, he shows them more about who he is. And their response to him is challenged. And they, they fail again. But Jesus continues his work in them. For you and I, it's not about getting it right. The confusing circumstances of life bring us back to those times where we trust him, where we begin to say what we believe even when we don't understand it. And then we, we take what we know to be true about Jesus and we begin to return back to a sense of trust, a sense of surrender, a, a moment where we said, not my way, but yours, not my time, but yours, not my resources, but yours, not my accomplishments, but your activity on my behalf. It's, it's really the bottom line of Christian living. It's Christ living in us. It's his life in us that's the source of our hope. It's, it's his activity in us that's help. To, to find forgiveness, then to be cleansed and be able to take the next steps in obedience to develop a, a way in which we depend, a lifestyle of dependence on his resources to be enough for us. The disciples' hearts do soften as they encounter the living Christ. Their ideas are brought under his influence and the activity of Jesus becomes the center the focal point of their lives. And it was that realization that Jesus is the key to navigating confusing circumstances that enabled a group of doubting, untrained, almost hopelessly confused men and women to change the world, to demonstrate to people someone that they had never seen whose life was vital and available even for those that never ate the fish, never tasted the bread for themselves. Because Christ's life was real in the lives of his followers. It's there in Jesus for you and for me. Life's confusing. Jesus is the answer. But nobody can do it for you. No, no pastor can preach his way for you to find your path. Only Jesus, as revealed in his word, can lead you. His work will be enough for you if it's enough for anyone. It's enough for you. So, Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to this story about the disciples in difficult times, a difficult moment, and your son Jesus was enough. 
And so he is enough today. We declare it. And we ask for your help to live it. Enough to find forgiveness. Enough to find direction. Enough to find help. Enough for us to fill our hearts with meaning. To add to our day's significance. I don't know where that point is in your life. Where you're facing a challenge. I think each one of us faces challenges each day. None of you here are the exception to the rule that you need Jesus. But each one of you is unique in how that need is defined in this moment. Maybe in this moment you would ask for Jesus to be enough. Say, Lord, I recognize that I can't do it myself. I can't create a relationship on my own on my own description, but I know you've opened the way. I, I can't find my own direction, Father, but you sent Jesus to be the way. I don't have enough information to, to pick a direction for where I'm at. But I know you said that your son Jesus would be my guide, that the Holy Spirit that he sends would teach me about him and about life. Lord, I need that. I ask for that from your hand. Hmm. So, Heavenly Father, Lord, you, you see where each heart comes to a point of need. And Lord, I thank you for those places, for that process, for the invitation that our needs create for your work in our hearts. And I would pray again that our seeking hearts would find their satisfaction in your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So it's a challenging topic to take a narrative story like the experience of the disciples on a day and bring it to our experience in Days which seem so different. But they're not as different as you might think. But perhaps it's been a little confusing for you as I worked my way through it. And you might be interested in just talking and praying through some of those circumstances together. And I want you to know that I would enjoy that opportunity. You could take an information card in the rack of the benches in front of you. Just simply write your name and how to contact you, what would be the best way, and just say, hey, let's get together. Or perhaps you've made a significant decision and you want to share it with someone. And I'd love for you to just mark another, Lord, maybe today was significant in your life and I'd love to hear about it. You could take one of those information cards, hand it to me in the back after we're dismissed or leave it on my desk in the hallway. And uh, I would appreciate the chance to celebrate God's work, to talk about his ways with you this week. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. May you go in peace. Amen.